Yo, welcome back to another episode of Uproar's Rawcast, the brand new podcast from Uproar, where we'll be interviewing everyone from rock stars to porn stars, from actors to influencers. And every two weeks, we'll have a new guest coming in, a couple new guests coming in to talk to you guys. So this is the very first guest we've had on this program. These guys are they're the band that sort of, it was the very first emo band or emo album that I ever listened to. So it's sort of responsible for Uproar happening. They've had, I think, 10 studio albums, which is pretty crazy. So I'd like to introduce Ryan and Darren from Fume for a Friend. Hello. Yo. Hello. Good Hello. evening. Thank you guys for coming on the show. It's our pleasure. Thank you for having us. Lovely introduction. And I think we should be getting a share of uh, the profits, maybe somehow then. Of Uproar. Yeah. 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 If we're I, 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 can, I can tell you quite, <laughs> <laughs> quite confidently there's no profit. Oh. Yeah. There should be. Oh, well. It's worth, <laughs> Actually, worth a try. Right. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll start actually on that that point that I just made because I th- I'm pretty positive the very first emo album I ever heard was Casually Dressed, which would have been 2003, mm-hmm. I think. Is that? Yep. Yeah. So, and I'm pretty positive it was my mate in art class because I was still in school and he gave me the CD and listened to it like you know, under the desk trying to get away with it from the teachers. And that's what got me into the whole sort of scene because I was like a proper pop punk kid. So before that, there wasn't much emo going around. I think uh, The Used had released an album and Taking Back Sunday had, but that would have only been like at latest 2002. Mm -hmm. So back then, how did that scene start? How did you get into that sort of music? Because it was before Spotify and social media and all that sort of stuff. So if it was that new, but you've got bands on both sides of the planet doing the same thing at the same time, how did that arise um yeah i mean i think uh taking back sunday was was definitely the one that was coming through there was a lot of cool bands on on victory records at the time um you know yeah. Bo- boy sets fire and stuff like that um coheed and cambria were coming through at the time um well i mean they're still going strong but um i think it was a mix between um you know some of us were into that particular scene some of us were more into the metal side of things some of us were more into the the punk and hardcore side of things but i think it was that particular um emo scene if you like that was the one thing that connected us that we were all into and we all liked at the time because at the time it wasn't even emo like Mm. no i I think it was just kind of a bit of a a bit of fresh air in in terms of music you know coming through that, like Ryan said, there was there was kind of um, some comparisons, slight comparisons to a lot of other bands you're listening to, but maybe not amalgamated as such, you know? Yeah, totally. Because, I mean, for me at the time, I was into pop punk and it just made you a griebo. Mm. Like, there, there was no <laughs> sub, there weren't emos and pop punk kids or metalers. It was just you're a griebo or you're a chaff. Yeah. Like, yeah. One or the other. Yeah. But yeah, so following those years by sort of 2005 i think that's when the emo coin had been turned Turned yeah been coined yeah (laughs) i I guess i guess bands were just tapping into the more melodic side of things because we'd all been in bands before in the south wales area in heavier bands you know just hardcore style or metal bands or whatever but but when all this cool melodic stuff was coming over from the states i think that was well, it was two things. I mean, it was the melodic stuff coming over from the States, and then it was the fact that we found someone who could actually sing, which was quite rare at the time. It was uh, Looking back, it, it was it was like Goldust trying to find a singer who could actually sing. You know, there the, the were singers who you could get away with it in the studio. You could auto-tune them, and it's like, oh, okay, it sounds all right on record, but then you get on the stage, and it's, and it's you know, it just sort of fall apart. But... Um, but yeah, you know, when when Matt um, sort of came out of the woodwork sort of thing, you know, because he was a guy who we knew from going to hardcore shows and stuff. He used to write his own fanzine called Third Engine, and he was sort of that guy with the backpack selling fanzines. And then all of a sudden when it transpired that he could actually sing, it was like, oh, okay, well, you know, we can we can play all this heavy stuff, and we're all from heavy backgrounds, but... Here's someone who can sing, so let's try and write some uh, melodic stuff for him to sing over. And I think that was the the genesis of it, really. And, we, and at the time, we were obviously kind of doing the the two vocal kind of idea, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when, when it first kind of kicked off, and um, like Ryan said, you know, the fact that Mac could kind of sing these soaring choruses, you know, you know, to perfection, really, you know, it, 
the guy's kind of um, tune in and, and, you know, his voice is, is, is so spot on, you know, his pitching and, and stuff is great uh, and always has been, you know. So, I mean, um, yeah, it, w- it was a case of, yeah, stumbling across that in a way and... Um, and all and just coming together. Yeah. It really was that. It really was that because so many of us um, in the band had known each other for a long time before. I mean, myself and Darren had been in a band years earlier and it was like a, a rap metal band. And again, it's because we found someone who was a, like a hip hop guy who could rap. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're, there, was, there's, there was just so many people in South Wales who could play their instruments, but there was so little, uh, you know, a little amount of people who could actually be a vocalist. So, so we found someone who could rap. It's like, okay, well, we'll do a, like a rap metal band. So we were in a band there before. Um, and then, you know, we, we knew Chris from from way back then, from being just being at shows. And, and that was a thing. We just never had that singer, really. And uh, that was the final piece of the puzzle. Then. And um, that's why we weren't just doing hardcore or metal, because we found someone who could actually fit this you know like i say the final piece of the puzzle yeah absolutely man and there's so many bands that actually came out of wales like mm. there yeah. seems to be more at least in this scene more bands coming out of wales than everywhere else in the uk it was, i mean like, you know wales has always going to be in a hotbed for music you know uh, and you'd had kind of you know bands previous um and movements of music like the manix or stereophonics you know within the indie scene so, I mean, there's always been bands there um, and there's always kind of been a hotbed for plenty of bands. But, um, yeah, it seemed as if kind of once a few broke through, then kind of a lot of people were looking towards Wales then and seeing that there was a lot more bands there. You know, there was, there, there was putting out great stuff and writing great songs. Because there was always so many bands there because that was our thing. We would, um, you know, whether it be once a month or twice a month, we would... Used to have a venue in Newport called TJ's, which is quite a quite a famous venue, and uh, we would hire that probably you know the sort of first Saturday of of every month or whatever, and we would just sort of put the word out there, and if anyone any any bands want to play it, um, we, you know we'll all come together and chip in and, and pay the booking fee for the for the venue, and then everyone just shares the you know the ticket things, and um, and lots of bands would come through, and you you know we we, we had so many bands that we met, you know I mean. Um, Jeff Giljohn, who went on to be Bullet for My Valentine, um, and of course, I mean, I think a level above that then at the time was, was Skinned Red, who had come from being Dub War, which were, um, you know, a big influence in terms of the fact that I mean, me and Darren used to go to the the Dynamo Open Air Festival in in the nineteen nineties in uh, in Holland. It was like you know the biggest, it's just this legendary festival in Holland, and we used to go every year and. Um, just the fact that the dub war played it was just, you know, totally blew our minds. You know, this was like Benji that we used to see at the gigs in Newport and whatnot. And that was just gives you that sort of extra bit of belief then that you can actually do yeah, something. Yeah, the incentive to see that other people have managed to kind of break through and, and do cool things, you know. So you shouldn't kind of not, you know, attempt to do it at least. Yeah, yeah, totally, man. Mm. And, and, and again, you know, you mentioned Stereophonics earlier. They came from... You know, they're from my small town in Wales that I grew up in, and that was a massive thing when when they broke. I think literally everyone in the town in you know in the village had that record, and just little things like that that make you think. Well, actually, we, if we you know if we work hard at this and if we can manage to get good, then this could happen. You know, it's not um it's not the pipe dream that it was maybe for the last five years that we were messing around in bands for. Oh, it's achievable, you know. Yeah, that's, we, yeah we when you see, see someone that. else do it, it becomes realistic to you. Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. And and that's what we were seeing, and that's kind of, you know, around us in, in, in multiple ways, you know what I mean? Bands breaking through, you know, okay, maybe not in the same genres or whatever, but, it was, you know, there's a lot of kind of success we you, you'd see, which meant that kind of we felt it was achievable then, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, when was the sort of tipping point for you guys when you realized it was going well? Or wasn't the one where did it just, it was so, was there a point where you just like, fuck, man, this is happening? Well, for me, it was kind of from the outside at the start because the band, I was in another band at the time and um, and, and Funeral had done an EP, uh, recorded like a, well, it was a demo and and that got sort of signed then to, to, to like a small Welsh label. And even that it was like, oh wow, that's cool that they've done that. Um, 
and that you know Darren was in the band, so I was like, oh, amazing. And um, and then when their drummer left, then and um, and Darren asked me to come and um, I think I was filling in for I think that's what it was. I was I was filling in for a Radio One live session. Um, yeah, helping us with that and, and maybe a show as well. Yeah, there was there was a Radio One live session and there was a show supporting Hell Is for Heroes. Um, and then both of those things to me were like, wow, you know, that's the two biggest things that I've done is like a recording a, a studio session for Radio One and then B playing a show with Hell Is for Heroes. It's like, wow, yeah, that's so from the outside for me that was like, oh yeah, I'll do that. That's cool. And then when I actually sort of got there and started rehearsing with the guys and 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 they were telling me about the the cool things that were happening, you know, there's like, oh, this label has been in touch and this agent has been in touch and it's like, wow, that's that's pretty cool. And, and so we did those two things and um, a couple more things and I got asked to join permanently and then um, I guess from there, what came next? What was the what, what was the thing then that blew our minds? I don't know. I think it, it was mainly, I think, from that it became the amount of labels that started showing interest and would be calling this little label that we were attached to at the time. And, you know, there was kind of Sony from the States would kind of call and, you know, and, and and, and you know, good number of major labels, but also some pretty big independent labels as well. You know, and um, and I think that transcended then into a situation where we started creating more demos to begin with, to to kind of give and send out to some of these labels uh, to keep their interest sort of peaked. Um, and then it went on to a situation where we were doing a showcase up in London for it must have been about twenty five labels, kind of. We did mul- multiple sort of um, runs through our our kind of six song set or whatever <laughs> for about four labels at a time or whatever, wasn't it? Mm. Took up most of the day in this little um, sort of grungy sort of looking Putney rehearsal studio. Nothing like these cool rehearsal sta- studios, yeah. you know. But um, yeah, but it, that you know, when all that was happening, that was where for myself and anyway, personally, I started to think wow, this is kind of, you know, really kind of going somewhere and, and is, you know, it was amazingly exciting, obviously. Um, but that was the, the realisation, I think, that it seemed like kind of things were kind of, you know, happening, I yeah, guess. That's awesome, man. I think it's like, it's cool if you can pinpoint a moment because then you've got that specific memory of just excitement. And like, that's, that's what makes it worthwhile, isn't it? So, definitely, yeah. yeah, definitely. And I think and I think from there then with... Uh, certainly myself i think all of us is when the management thing started coming around and um and uh, we played a show there was it's called the kerrang weekend uh, um you know they, they only had it a couple of times it was down in on the coast in canberra sands it was like in a essentially it was in the butlins like yeah, holi- holiday yeah. camp um but we got invited to play there which which was which was a huge deal because there was loads of cool bands playing but um so for some for some reason iron maiden's manager was there and uh, Rod Smallwood is, you know, super well-known um, and respected manager. And I don't know how or why, but he, but he saw our set and, and loved it then. And um, he was at Sanctuary Artist Management at the time and managing Maiden and all sorts. And um, and then he was working with a, a gentleman named Craig Jennings, who I'm sure you know, um, you know, Craig from well. the, yeah, you know, from the Birmingham area. And he said, you know, you need to go and check out this band and, uh he started calling us Mini Maiden, which was, <laughs> you yeah. know, no no pressure. Um, and then yeah, w- once we got involved in all of that, then and um, I remember we went to we went to sign our management deal at their offices, and um, and on 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 the same night we we got invited to to tour Europe with with Iron Maiden, which was like just us and Maiden. That was the bill, and and you know that was just completely mind blowing for us. Oh, you absolutely, know, yeah, just. Uh, our favorite, our favorite band growing up, essentially, and 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 to have that, to have that, to, you know, that almost that seal of approval, and to feel welcomed into that amazing fraternity was just uh, pretty mind blowing, honestly. Yeah, that's pretty incredible, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. You know, it, it you know, it was, it was kind of many sort of situations and moments, but that was kind of especially for the members of the band like myself and Ryan and and Chris as well were. Massive Maiden fans, you know what I mean? It was, yeah, it was crazy. And Nick and McBrain coming in after we'd signed the management deal. Welcome to the family, guys. Welcome to the family. 
Yeah. <laughs> Giving it all that. Just, just so happened to be my birthday as well, I remember. And he's like, <laughs> uh, happy birthday, son. Welcome to the family. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. That's fucking awesome, man. Yeah. I mean, touching on the management, because you've actually been a manager now for quite a few years. Yeah. I think you've yeah. had some pretty successful bands and you've, um, from what I could tell, you moved away from actually playing yourself to focus more on the management. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that was pretty much exactly what it was, really. Um, it was something that I'd started taking an interest in whilst I was still in the band, uh, whilst I was still playing in Funeral, um, towards, I guess, you know, around 2008, 2009 sort of time. It was, um, you know, I wasn't, it's not that I was getting bored with being in the band, but I was I was kind of looking for something else to to do aside from that as well. You know, I yeah. didn't want that just to be my like one thing. And I started managing, um, I, they, they, they were a bunch of, like we said earlier, a, ba- a bunch of cool Welsh bands coming through again. Yeah. And I was like, you know, these, these are great. I want to, I want to help these bands. I want to try to get them in front of people and bring them on tour with us and, and so on that, you know, when we did that bands like straight lines and, and, and tiger please and stuff like that. And, um, and I just kept getting more into that, really, and it, uh, getting a lot of um, satisfaction from sharing in their achievements then. And, you know, just like me and Darren have been talking about now, about when we felt things were happening for Funeral and those really exciting things, I was getting them all over again then with other bands, you know, the first yeah. time that they were in Kerrang or the first time that um, they signed a record deal or made a video or whatever it might be, you know, I was getting that same buzz and and it was really exciting for me and then once i decided that my 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 time of full-time touring was uh, was coming to an end i knew that, that was something that i wanted to do um and um and again luckily you know i got to transition pretty swiftly into that um over uh, at raw power management who who were our management from from day one so you know i got to go over there and, and work with loads of amazing bands like um, Bullet for Valentine and Tonight Alive and Cross Faith and all sorts of uh, Bleed From Within, all sorts of cool bands. Um, so yeah, do it, did that until around 2017 and start my own thing from then. I think we might have met at South by Southwest. Did mm. were you there with Young Guns? No. Okay, then somebody else. <laughs> no, no, I, no. I, I never actually did. I never actually did. Go to South by Southwest. I don't know why, but um, it never actually worked out um, for going there. Could it be Matt Ash, maybe? There, there, there's oh. a, yeah, there, there, there's a, there, there was always a, you know, a big raw power contingent. Yeah, at, uh, I remember Craig introducing me to a few people, and I recognised the names when he did it. Ah, uh, there you so go, like, yeah. Oh, but okay, I, guess I mean, I'm sure they're, they're still about doing their thing now, probably with raw power, you know. It's, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I did, sorry, I did that till like 2018 and then decided to, do my own thing then, which I've been doing since, which has been a lot of fun. I mean, how do you think the music industry has changed? I mean, not so much the scene, because with you guys, I hate the word matured, but <laughs> as your albums progress, I hate using like, you know what I mean? It's like, mm. You started off very edgy, very emo, and then by the sort of third album, it became more sort of anthemic rock, sort of more straightforward rock than it being emo. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't think it was. You know, it wasn't intentional. The kind of, I think that we necessarily made those changes. It just felt right to kind of go in that direction. Yeah. And I think we were we were all of the mindset that kind of we just go with what sort of feels right. And you know, we never really had any pressure from the label or anything to change or or, or you know stop doing this style or, or you know stop making it quite so heavy or whatever. Uh, you know, we never had any pressure really like that from the label as such. So, I mean, it was more a case of just what sort of felt sort of right at the time, wasn't it? And how the songs were coming together. I think a lot of it was that we 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 we, we would tour really really hard. You know, we'd we'd be on tour just nonstop. Um, you know, UK, Europe, Australia, Japan, and we'd be we'd spend a good you know at least six months a year in America. Yeah, uh, you know, at, at, at least it's the dream, man. Yeah, I well, love America. Well, that was it. You know, we were playing. I think that was it. We we'd be playing so much on on tour that I think by the time we got to making records, because we were playing so much that we were wanting to do something different every time. And I think if you listen to all our records, really, they're all. I don't think there's any two records that like oh, you know, they sound the same. Really, you know, when you, when you, when you go through the same album over and over, which. 
I think I'm, I'm not wrong in saying some bands, you know, do that, you know, but you and know, do it well, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. If that well, if that's what feels right for them to do, that that's cool, obviously, you know. But I think it goes back to what we were saying at the beginning of um, of the interview. Is like because we were all from different, you know, having different musical tastes and backgrounds. I think that um, as we approached each different record, you know, certain people's tastes were maybe getting, you know, um, becoming more overpowering in, 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 you know, not a bad way, but more, you know, I can look at certain records and, and be like, oh, you know, that's more of a Matt record, if that's more of a Chris record, or more of what I'm into or Darren, you know, I, I can, I can, I, I can hear that with the records, but I mean, that's just, if we were all just coming into this band from exactly the same place, then I'm sure all the records would probably sound a lot more similar, but I think that's what, what a lot of it came down to. And we have got, you know, and still have really, you know, a real kind of mixture of, of tastes and, and kind of an inspiration from kind of various styles of music, you know, and, and, we had that, like Ryan said, from day one, really, which made our melting pot that much more interesting, I guess, yeah, and, totally. and and helped with the sound that came out, kind of, you know, we, when we were writing songs, I think. Yeah. I mean, looking at it from a manager point of view, do you think there's been a massive, because I, I think there has been, I, I bitch about all this all the time, but obviously I'm not seeing it from sort of the inside, I'm seeing it from a pl club perspective. Um, so to me, there seemed to be like a massive shift in attitude, um, from, I always say about 2013. So between sort of, I mean, 2002, which is when I started sort of listening to, to music in 2013, it seemed that there was a lot of positivity in hard work in a band and bands seemed to recognize it as a, a job and as a career and the fact that it needed to make money and they needed to like fucking work and there's a lot of bands that sort of by about 2013 had sort of blown up become huge massive sort of stadium bands like um oh, i'm trying to think now fall out boy stuff mm -hmm. like that mm. and you could you could really easily see the the work that had gone into it yeah and then in sort of 2013 it seemed to swap and it'd be that suddenly if anyone actually put in any work they became a sellout. Mm. And it sort of seemed to switch to being like, if you're successful, then you're a sellout. Mm. Whereas before that, it was if you're successful, it's fucking badass. Yeah. Like, that's what you wanted. And I I seem to, th I think that it was like that from sort of 2013 to about 18. And then in 2018, 19, it sort of started to cross back mm. into people wanting to achieve big things again. Um and I always sort of chalk it up to being that there was a lot of people that were 10 years ago in sort of hardcore or emo bands, left that scene, became rappers and started moving back into it. And in the rap world, it's like, it's all about fucking money and bling and bitches. And yeah, it's, it's all, mm -hmm. it's all showboating. Mm. And them coming back into rock seems to bring back in the idea that it's okay to actually work your ass off and be successful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, rock's in an interesting place at the moment, you know, where you see who the uh, who the biggest people are, you know, you sort of Machine Gun Kellys and things like that, you know, it's these massive mainstream people are, are kind of at the forefront of the of of the rock movement and sort of coming into rock and wanting to be a part of that, which I know, you know, a, a lot of people think that's awful and and disgusting and <laughs> whatever, but I mean, if it's if it's going to bring people's eyes and, and ears towards rock and to you know to listen to to rock music and for you know young kids or whatever to to give rock a chance um you know if they come in and you know through a machine gun kelly album find you know something else um i can't think of any names top of my head but you know if, if if that brings them into the scene so to speak and and makes them a rock fan then then cool you know i mean it's like it's like with us your, your first band you get into are never like the heaviest band or the coolest band or mm. whatever. You know, you need those gateway bands, and um, and I think if 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 people like that are bringing bringing people into rock and and and, and that helps the the rock scene overall, then then I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think kind of you know, like like Ryan said, you know, the more support, the more kind of 
eyes on rock and people getting into it kind of it makes it kind of you know a, a lot bigger it makes it kind of you know um more opportunities for the bands within in the genre you know yeah definitely man i think i think it's really fucking positive like i think it's brilliant that there's going to be kids that the equivalent of me that are now being brought back into it which i don't think that had for five six seven years yeah i, I think kind of you know it went through a very strange kind of you know change as in the music industry itself you know yeah um and i think it's taken quite a long time for a, a number of genres probably to get a foothold again and, and see how they fit into the new industry and how they can make it work for that particular genre you know i think that's you know something that's kind of ha- that's happened as well which you know plays its part yeah definitely i think that's a big thing well that's it i mean with new technology and with your spotify and stuff you know if, if a kid is listening to a i don't know willow smith with travis barker on it and then and then the next thing that pops up in their spotify is like a a, a blink song and then that goes to an alkaline trio song or and, and so on then that's cool you know that's that's good that's good for us that's good for us all i think Definitely, man. I think the more people that get back into it, the fucking better. I think absolutely, it's, yeah, it's absolutely. a great, yeah. great move forward. Yeah. I mean, with you guys getting back together, like I'm guessing that was because you did the charity shows. Yeah, but was that something that you were thinking about doing before anyway? Because no. you hadn't done anything for a while. No, I mean, and we weren't really. I mean, I kind of left in around 2010. I think Ryan left in 2011. Mm. Um. And, you know, the guys carried on for a few more years then before they decided to kind of, you know, stop completely. Um, and none of us were necessarily, yeah, thinking of, of you know, even suggesting it really. It, it just all came around. No, well, we, we were both at the, the you know, the, the final show in, in 2016. We both did our little little cameos yeah, <laughs> with, yeah. the, with the band and um, it felt very final. And um, I think all of us, at that point, I mean, you know, like Darren said, he and I hadn't been in the band for, for some years, but certainly felt to me like everyone else felt like that was it. Yeah. Definitely. That's the, that's the feeling I got as well, yeah. And and therefore kind of didn't see, you know, a reunion as such come in, really. And it, it was all down to, you know, a good friend of, of ours, you know, Stu Brothers kind of um, with, his, you know, um, his illness, um that kind of brought us back together and then with the realization of whilst doing that and playing the shows, you know, uh, uh, on behalf of him in a sense, um, we loved kind of hanging out again and rehearsing and, and then playing the shows. We had great fun and, and it was, you know, it was, it was great being around one another again, kind of because we're kind of spread out now with, you know, Matt lives in Germany, Chris lives in London. Why Germany, man? Like, I wife. quite like Germany, but of all the places, his wife's German, so that's uh, okay, that's a good reason. <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll do it. Uh, yeah. But 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 that was it. I mean, that was and, and again, that was just going to be that. You know, it be, I mean, originally it was going to be two shows, which turned into three, um, and it wouldn't have been any more than that if it wasn't for um, an opportune phone call from from Andy Cop in the day after the London show. Um, and then when I saw my phone ringing that day on the way home in the van, I knew exactly what was coming. Um, and he's like, you know, I heard it was amazing yesterday. We'd love you to do download next year. Um, so we said, oh, one more. Should we do one more for download? Because because we only did the, we did the two shows in Cardiff and one in London. And um, and there were so many people who were saying, you know, I, oh, I would love to have come. I couldn't get a ticket or, you know, yeah. I couldn't get to Cardiff or, or whatever. So it's like, okay, if we do this one more show then, at download then at least in theory anyone who did want to come and did want to see us one one more time could do that um but then of course the the pandemic happened and um and and download got moved back so uh it was one of those things was like okay right we'll do we'll do the one more tour thing and and download but then <laughs> slam dunk um Came so well, yeah, one thing's kind of led to another in, in some ways. So it's, 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 it's been a lot more than we expected it to be um, and it's gone on longer, obviously, again, because of the pandemic. I mean, it was uh, it was meant to be, you know, long done by now. Yeah. But um, but yeah, that's uh, that's kind of how it's turned out and, uh, and here we are. <laughs> so are you, are you planning this to be the last one or are you thinking or are there just the no plans? 
I think it feels that ended. Uh, yeah, I because think it would make sense for there to be an anniversary tour in two thousand and twenty-three. Yeah, well, I mean, this year is twenty years now, so that's um, so that's sort of um, so that's been a good thing because we would have if things had gone the way that they were supposed to, and there wasn't any pandemic. I mean, yeah, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> saying that I'm glad there was one because I was obviously I'm not, but um, you know, we would have been done by the end of twenty twenty. That would have been it. So we wouldn't have, um, I suppose, had that twenty-year uh, anniversary, c- yeah, celebration like. as such. So, we, so that's that's something. But, um, but like you say, yeah, I mean, you know, we've 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 got download as the the sort of final thing in the calendar. But um, yeah, twenty years casually dressed. We'll uh, I guess we'll have to see. I mean, I personally think it should happen. Yeah, I mean, just yeah. yeah I suppose <laughs> it's one of those never say never kind of situations. But Fair. but. In some ways, you know, we're not planning anything else. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So, I think um, I think if we were to do it, it'd have to be, you know, again, the reason why we came back is it'd have to be something special. Yeah. I mean, you know, twenty years just in itself is is pretty special. Um, but I don't think we could just do, you know, a show just at a sort of regular event. It'd have to be something. I don't know what that would be, but. Um, yeah, just to create the excitement for you guys, for, for yeah, and for everyone else you as want well. It to yeah, be exciting. You want to feel that rush, don't you? Yeah, so you, want, I guess you want it to it's... kind of be an event in a sense, you know, and be something you know you, that really marks something properly, you know. Yeah, I mean, whether that be somewhere that we've never played, or you know, a venue that we've never played, or or something, you know, you do with a orchestra or something. I don't know. I mean, you know, just something different and That'd special. It would. Yeah, I mean, I'd quite like that. I mean. Uh, when we did the Tales and Tell Themselves album, myself and Darren went along to the uh, the orchestral recording session, which was uh, was pretty pretty mind blowing for me. I'm yeah, sure. it yeah. was yeah very sort of emotional and moving. It was it was yeah, it was it was it was a weird experience. It was it was just so euphoric in a way listening to yeah this this orchestra playing kind of you know along to kind of you know some of the, the songs. How did and that stuff. come about? How how did you go from just being like I'm going to smash the set on a guitar to I want an orchestra? Well, I mean, we, we when we were writing that album, um, we were again, you know, looking to do something a little bit different, and um, it was, I guess, well, it wasn't the first time, um, you know, I'd done some like keyboard stuff in the album because I did stuff on on the other records as well, you know, like like Sunny Off Hours and stuff like that. Um, but um, because we were doing things that were a bit more um, you know, laid back and not so quite riffy and um, and whatnot. There was room for for putting stuff on top. So you know, I was doing some of that stuff on piano and uh, writing some little things. You know, just just really basic stuff. Um, and and then I think it it sort of started really with you wrote and 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 did it like a demo of um, like an intro really to the album. It yeah, was meant to be, and then. I put some guitar melodies on top of what you put on keyboards on it. And when we went into pre-production with Gil Norton, he heard that and was adamant that we should turn it into a song. Yeah. And that became into oblivion. Yeah. And because of what Ryan had put down keyboard wise with the strings and stuff like that as, as the intro and this guitar melody had played over the top, it kind of, it felt like it warranted real orchestra, you know, to to you know, r- sort of resemble what kind of Ryan had, had done on the keyboard in a sense, but obviously on a on a on a much yeah, bigger, well, well, yeah scale. on on a crazy on a crazy skill yeah because because Gil um you know we were working with Gil who's from a much more rock background you know he did like the Color and the Shape by Foo Fighters and by Futures by Jimmy Will and lots of Pixies records and stuff like that so it was like you know that's the type of record that we wanted to make a uh, rock record and um and as Darren said when he heard that what was just going to be an intro to the record, which was that, you know, beginning of Into Oblivion. And he's like, you know, we've got to do something with this. We've got to make something of this. And um, he'd worked with a string composer named Audrey Riley, who um, she did all the strings to like Smashing Pumpkins, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness, you know, like Tonight Tonight and all that sort of amazing stuff. And um, Feeder and, and Fe- a few others. Yeah, there, like, yeah. you know, like Just the Way I'm Feeling by Feeder and like Muse, you know, a bunch of Muse stuff. So she came in and um, listened to everything and she put these charts down and she went away 
And she came back with these sort of like demos that she'd done on keys, which were like, oh, wow, you know, it's mind blowing. But to actually go then and see it done like real and, and watching it with actual this, instruments, orchestral instruments. With yeah, it. with this massive orchestra. And it, it was just like completely mind blowing watching it. And not just that as well. I mean, we had all these other extras like um, the the sort of the choral vocal thing you hear, you know, that's the that's the group that did all the Harry Potter soundtracks and stuff as well. Yeah. Awesome. Which, which was, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Which was mental. And, and then we had this guy then come in on, on percussion, this percussionist. And um, I think, I think he was on Portugal or something, wasn't he? Yeah. He's this Portuguese guy. And, and then we were to find then he's like, Oh yeah, I'm the percussionist for the Rolling Stones. I'm like, Oh shit. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. And he's like, and he's, I was like, Oh, he's like, he must be a pretty well known guy. And then goes like, Oh yeah. Yeah. He's one of the, uh, judges on the portuguese um like uh, x factor i was like okay weird so so he was literally he was just he was sitting in there in in the room on a chair and he was like sort of surrounded by all these different instruments on the floor and he just had like a big cuban cigar and a, and a head headset and he and we'd play something and he'd be looking around on the floor like okay yeah pick this up and he i'm playing away and start doing all this stuff and it was just, just absolutely mind-blowing whilst he still had this big fat cigar in his in his mouth and he was just doing this stuff so cool yeah. awesome i love that <laughs> i like you yeah, like it when you've got some really random fucking situation and you oh, sort yeah. of stood there and part of you's like what the fuck is going on and then part of you's just really appreciating it yeah you know, like, yeah i had this really bizarre one uh it was at south by southwest and we were staying, there was a guy, I can't actually fucking remember his name, but he had started a record label. He was a multimillionaire. His wife was basically part of the family. I think that they were the sixth richest family in America. Yeah. And she was just like full blown fucking hippie. And he came from just the absolute redneck. Have you ever watched that program, Duck Dynasty? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> he was like someone off Duck Dynasty. And they just, I guess, met, fell in love. Like he was massive into his bands, like wanted to be a rock star. And they brought this studio that was like a really well-known studio in Texas. And they'd redone half of it. So it was, you know, fucking multi-million pound refurb. And then half of it, they just hadn't bothered. They'd just sort of been like, eh, fuck it. Mm. It's effort. And it was just like left almost half derelict. And we had gone back to hang out with him. So it was me and my dad. I think, have you met Roy? No, I haven't yet, no. no. You'll, you'll get to meet him later. I, I hope I do, yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, there's me and Roy. I'm stone cold so bad because I'm driving. And we've gone to the studio. It's about 3 a.m. And there's him, there's his wife. And then there's these two dudes there. And I don't remember what their names were, but the one guy had just wrote like Lady Gaga's number one hit and another guy had wrote one for like Bruno Mars or something. So that, that, they were really young. Each of them were about 19. And so they just, they were hanging out. They were just loving that you know, rich guys were yeah. paying them to get fucked up. And this dude sat just absolutely fucking wrecked. Really, every fucking drug you can imagine, all the drink. He was fucked up his face. Sat in the middle of this derelict room with his legs crossed and a pheromone. Doing... <laughs> 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 These two dudes that were like trying to play piano alongside him, like accompany him, but they couldn't because... You can't really accompany a fucking pheromone. No, no, it's kind of all over the place. And and his wife just danced barefooted around him, like Ugh, sort dance. of. You, you know how like you see like pixies dancing in the woods. Yeah, it yeah. was that sort of thing. And I was just stood there sober, watching it, being like, "What the fuck is going?" You on? You can't be watching that sober. Yeah, like, <laughs> that's already like it's that dis sounds bizarre, disorientating yeah. to me. Just hearing about it. Yeah, it was it was nuts, man. But it was cool. Oh, some you, sort of you crazy. Do, you, you get those weird yeah. crazy dream. <laughs> you sure it was real? I'm, I'm pretty positive. I got pulled by the police on the way home, so. Oh right, yeah. So I was I was pleased pleased that I was sober. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good but <laughs> getting get, get back to you guys, <laughs> I love Southwest Southwest. Yeah, strange um, place. With the the tour that's coming up, because mm. you're playing songs from the the first three albums, how did you pick those songs? Are they ones that they're just the hits that you think people want to hear, or they your personal favourites? Are you just doing what you? think it's going to be fun like yeah i think is it going to change are you going to do different songs on different days or maybe have you not even picked not really you haven't got a, a, an absolute set in stone set list yeah i don't um 
I think a lot of them have proven themselves over the years to be, you know, really big songs that kind of, you know, um, and that, that work great live. Um, but there are definitely some in there. I think they're kind of a band favourites and, and uh, you know, some mm. of our favourites for sure, yeah. I mean, we, we, we played those songs so many times and for so long that, you know, we, we get to know which ones work you know i mean it's the same as yourself when you're djing or wherever you know you, know, you kind of know the the songs that work and you sort of trial and error one week you try something else blah 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 i mean through, through all the gigs we've, we've we've played i mean we get you get to know which ones are the ones that are always hit but um i mean it's in, in saying that i mean you know if it does end up being the last thing we do then it, it's nice as well to play some songs that maybe you haven't played in a, in a really long time just to just, just for fun, I suppose. I mean, there's al- there's always some people in the crowd wanting to hear the um, obscure yeah, B-sides, the deep cuts <laughs> and the B sides and stuff. Yeah, we always get that. Oh, play the B sides. Everyone loves the B sides. So there yeah. you go. We'll see. Throw a few in just to to play, though. Yeah, why not? Why not? <laughs> yeah, keep them, keep them happy. Awesome. I think we're just about out of time. Yep. I'm getting, I'm getting the nod. Okay. <laughs> so, awesome, guys. Thank you for coming in and talking to us. It's been fucking awesome. Yeah, pleasure, man. Thanks Thank for you. having us, man. So follow these guys on Instagram. Make sure you're at their tour. Next one up is State Champs. We'll have those in a couple of weeks. So tune back in for that. Hit like, hit subscribe. Tell everyone else to fucking listen to it. If this is the start of the episode and you've missed the entire thing, like it fucking anyway. And if you don't, actually think it's interesting still hit like because it's good for us so thank you guys we'll catch you next week hey guys thanks for watching as a thank you the guys in funeral have given us two tickets to give away to any one of their 2022 tour shows so all you have to do is share this on facebook tag us in it and we'll pick a winner at random